Okay. It looks so. Can you see the subtitles aren't currently available thing? Uh, that's what it said. Yeah, that's what it says on my screen. So. Oh, it went away. Okay, good. Yeah, I but I can see, I can see your full screen though. So. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, I think, um, Carrie, I think what we'll go ahead and do is I'll do a quick introduction. I think we were about at that time. It's about noon now. And then uh, I'll let you go ahead and get started. And uh, we're, we're excited to hear um, about your about your project. I know a little bit of a background, but just for those of you that don't know, that are out there um, and don't know Carrie, she did her uh, undergraduate work at Ohio State in kind of an interesting program um, called the Personalized Study Program, where you get to combine different fields and, and, and Carrie combined zoology with ecology with music education into a single major. And they did an uh, undergraduate research thesis um, looking at song feature shifts in, in northern cardinals and American robins, which is uh, really, really quite cool. Um, and then she took a two year break, it looks like, and uh, you founded a group called uh, One Note at a Time to teach music in, ha in Haiti. And maybe some of the students will have questions about that later um, that you could share more details about that. And then uh, Carrie did her PhD at Scripps uh, in biological oceanography with field sites kind of all over the place, Alaska, Mexico, Hawaii, uh, looking at soundscape parameters uh, with respect to gray humpback and, and bowhead whales. Um, she then did her postdoc here at UNH with, with Jen. That's where I met Carrie and some of you did as well. Um, and then uh, did a Fulbright in Columbia, which is what she'll be talking about today. I'm excited to hear about this project and is now working as a senior scientist at Applied Ocean Sciences. So, sciences. so Carrie, thanks again so much for coming and um, uh, Zooming with us and telling us about your science and, and I'll turn it over to you at this point. Awesome, thanks Dan. You can still hear me okay? Are we good on that end? Yep, yep, all Perfect. good. Yeah, so like Dan said, um, today's presentation is gonna be about um, what started as my Fulbright project um, in Columbia, for the Pacific coast of Colombia, and it, the work's continuing now. We're still figuring out how to do field work for this season, considering I can't travel and no one can travel. Um, and how you know do we do that safely when we're trying to create a long-term time series? Um, but today's going to be more of like an introduction of reasons soundscapes might be different. You know, lessons learned in the field in a country that was not my own um, that I think can shed light on maybe how to how field words how field sites can be best picked um, for understanding variability across the globe, um, as well as some updates on primarily work that the students have been doing for their theses um, to get at soundscape analyses and baseline uh, status of several species in the Gulf of Tribuga. So you're gonna see photos from Felipe Mesa throughout, which are just absolutely gorgeous. Um, if anyone wants to follow him, you should. He's on Instagram, so I'm just going to put that plug in for him. So, next slide is going to let me, there we go. So the Pacific coast of Colombia, we specifically picked that area um, because it's relatively unaffected by roads or other human sound sources um, compared to like, for example, the port of Long Beach or New York or any place with a highway or even a two-lane road um, because Dirt roads with tuk-tuks are about the closest thing that you get in the areas that we stay. Um, so you can see the Gulf of Tribuga here is off the Pacific coast, kind of halfway between Panama and Ecuador. Uh, the nearest port is the um, Puerto de Buenaventura that's about 200 kilometers south as the crow flies. And then, like I said, there's no roads. Um, there's two small airports in a town called Nuki and Valle de Solano. Um, and by small, I mean, there's one runway that's, you know, paved and brings in, I think the largest plane I've been on out of there might hold 30 people, maybe more like 20. So small aircrafts um, go in and out of there. And it's about a 45 minute flight from Medellin, um, if anyone knows Colombian geography. Um, and when I say like, this is an example of no roads. These, this overview of just pure jungle is what you see for like, the last two thirds of your flight when you're flying into Medellin, you're just over green the entire time um, until you get to the coast. So I'm going to jump off science for a little bit. I think it's important. I learned how important it was um, to understand the history of this area, to understand why 
there aren't roads, why there's not a whole lot of infrastructure, um, the way you'd see in like a lot of coastal cities, especially in the US, um, like it is not the equivalent of um, Los Angeles. So um, one of the historical reasons, so we're gonna go by three, three reasons. So historically, um, there's colonialism effects that are still lasting today on descendants of the enslaved peoples. Um, I'm gonna pull everything from Wikipedia because I'm not an expert on this, I'm not a historian, but there's excerpts of things that I've learned from people in conversations there that I'm just going to emphasize. Um, so the African Colombian population you can see is quite concentrated along the coastline. Um, in colonial era, this is where a lot of the plantations were for gold mines and sugar cane, et cetera. Um, and those were all along the coast. When Colombia got its independence, when Simon Bolivar um, fought to get independence from Spain along with, you know, Colombia along with several other countries and what was originally called Gran Colombia, um, outlawed slavery. Um, Humboldt actually has a really cool um, section in his, in his biography about how he, about how Simon Bolivar was a champion of um, not having enslavement. So once that was no longer part legal, um, a lot of plantation owners moved back into the cities, into the central area of the country. Um, a lot of people also wanted nothing to do with the plantations, um, went off on their own, did their own thing. And then about 100 years after that, the department, so department is like a county equivalent in the U.S. El Choco was created as the first predominantly African political administrative division, um, giving a sense of autonomy supposedly. Um, there's, you can hear arguments on both sides of whether or not this was a department that had freedom and autonomy from a government or was an excuse for the central government to sort of just give up and abandon that area. Um, arguments can be made in both directions. So political reason also, if you look at a map of the FARC, which was um, a rebellious group for decades um, that recently had a peace agreement in 2016. Um, their influence is also quite heavily distributed along the coastline. So for reference, Panama is here. You can compare that to the um, race demographics map from the previous slide. And I'm gonna point out that our site is right here. And we're a little south of that, where it says New Key kind of in that little southern U-shaped um, bay. So we're smack between um, two high areas of influence. It was a big thing in my Fulbright that I was not allowed to travel north or south into those regions or I could be sent back home um, pretty immediately. So um, if anyone ever followed what was going on with the FARC and encampments, you know, in jungles where it was harder for them to find, this area is very dense jungle. It is easy to hide. There was a lot of influence um, in that area. So again, infrastructure was not being built um, in that area. The third reason that is more geographical, there's three Andean corridors that run through the country itself. And we have, so that green band completely on the west side of the mountains. And I should say Bogota and Medellin are over here in the centers. So access across three corridors of mountains, um, not exactly accessible. And so all these three things kind of line up in a perfect storm of infrastructure not being developed in that area. What it does though, is create this little gap um, where this lower star would be where the new port is that they're proposing to build at our field site and trying to connect that by roads to a port on the Caribbean. Um, which could potentially would bypass the Panama Canal. So that's the plan that they're putting into place or discussing, um, and some countries are now financially backing, is to build a new port where our field site's going to go, create an entire highway infrastructure to ship those goods to a port in the Panama Canal, or sorry, in a port on the Caribbean, reinforce that port to carry that amount of goods, and then there's a, a way around the Panama Canal through Colombia itself. Um, so Choco today, I'll just show a couple people, um, you know, give names to faces or faces to names of people I might say throughout this. 
So ecotourism and gastronomy is a really big deal right now. So uh, Doña Cruz, which is, who's ha we rent the two bedrooms um, above her in this house. We stay with her family. She cooks for us. Her husband, Cheka, who's in the background, is our captain. Um, there's a few places in town where people do like beds and breakfasts and then cook for everybody make money that way there's a new restaurant in town Doña Cruz herself has been on we were there my first year and there was a documentary group from France that had come to cook with her um, she's this style of cooking is pretty renowned um, internationally even if you have you know French documentaries coming in to film you um, research so Natalia who is over here on the far right and up her picture she started this field site with a couple of friends um, in their undergrad to do an undergrad thesis. And then this field site is now served for all of her degrees. Um, and it's, we're not the only researchers there. There's also people who are working on sea turtles. Um, there's an entomologist group that's there. Um, a university has a field house uh, down the shore from us a bit. Um, so research is now becoming a pretty big thing um, now that it, it's a little safer to be there um, in these last few years because of the peace agreement. And so it's kind of opening up to that. Artisanal fishing traditionally was uh, the livelihood of everyone in the towns there. You went out to get dinner every you know, day in your own boat. Um, Cheka is our captain, like I said before. And a friend interviewed him for NPR's uh, Goats and Soda um, podcast this year, talking about how that has changed. Um, and so a lot of these guys who were very profitable doing artisanal fishing or, you know, survived on it at least, and it was a reliable source of income um, and food are switching over to the ecotourism. They're the ones using their personal boats to go out and do whale watching tours and mangrove tours and river tours um, in the area. And then on, which comes with that is how does uh, um, a rural area decide to permit the whale watching? Um, and so we get permission every year that we go from a council to say yes or no, we can do this research. Um, they're also heavily integrated into regulations for the whale watching industry itself. Um, so that's what Choco looks like today in the areas that we're looking in. Um, However, there's not huge boats that go through. So there's still the dugout canoes that people will use. And then it seems like each family more or less has um, an outboard boat or fishing boat uh, that they'll use to fish or do the whale watching or just to get from town to town. Because the only other way to get to the towns is you wait for the tide to go out far enough that you can walk along the beach if you're close enough. And we can do that to only the towns south of us. So everyone gets around on their, their uh, small outboard motor boats. Um, the motivation for this project was once I understood from Natalia and some people who had been working there how different that coastline was from the west coast of the U.S. say, or even just down farther south near Buenaventura where there's already boat traffic, and the fact that um, there's been a push to build a new international port in this area, this position may not change. Or when, if it changes, it's not going back. This would be a permanent shift in the ecosystem if a port was built. So anyone who does baseline studies wants the best possible baseline to get to compare to that. So shout out to Kevin. Um, he's making, and Kevin's in the same company that I am. He's gonna hate if I call him my boss, but I'm gonna do that. So if you take this AIS data where the boats, large boats that are large enough to be um, transmitting AIS signals, which transmit them, you can get global maps of this in real time on a website, take a snapshot of that where those boats are, and then combine it with wind. And you can look at the transmission loss of sound coming from those boats and surface winds in this map on the left. Um, and what you can see is there's a gap right up in that armpit of um, South America and Central America, which is right where we are. And there's nothing. Um, the biggest boats that we have going through there are shrimping boats, and then a little bit later, there, and then this is the fuel vessel that goes through I think every other Thursday that you go in and fill up your big barrels with gas um, as it drives by. So that's 
but that and the two shrimping boats that'll sit offshore for a few months every year are the largest vessels that go through that area. So that's about as perfect as we can get this day and age. Um, on top of that, this is the second most biodiverse place in the world behind Brazil. So 78 endangered species. I mean, this includes plants. It's a huge mangrove um, area of the world. I worked in Baja California and the mangroves there and they are nothing compared to the expanse of the mangroves here in Colombia. So the number of species that could be disturbed in the uh, mangrove ecosystem that could be disturbed from this port is high. So one of the questions is why is Buenaventura not being built up? Um, that was one of the proposals. It may still be something that's being talked about in the halls of Congress. I have no idea. Um, China apparently first looked into expanding Buenaventura and then in January 2019, there's a news article that they had financially backed the new port at Tribuga instead of the expansion of Buenaventura. Um, going back in old newspaper articles with a Google search, you can there's a couple of articles that came out like 1995 talking about building this port. Um, and then every so often they'd surface again, but it wasn't until 2019 that finances seemed to come in and this became a big deal. Because also last, um, earlier this US and Canada has also signed on financially. So three major world powers are, seem to be you know, contributing to the pockets of this project. Um, and why, so the event in Buenaventura, you need to dredge. Um, it's shallow water, it's mucky. Um, it's not, I guess it's not easy to dredge out. I understand that dredging makes a lot of noise, um, but it seems to be there's a desire to have a clean slate of just building something new here in Three Buga. Um, I'm just gonna say for reference, the house that we live in is right over here. So this is Koki, the little town of about 50 permanent residents that we stay in. Um, but Thribuga is a natural deep water canyon, so this is a desirable location for a new port. You can get those large ships in without having to dredge their path. Uh, this has prompted last year a No Puerto Thribuga Porque campaign on um, Twitter, so there's a hashtag for it. Um, the photos that you're seeing from Felipe Mesa, he's had those installed in the government buildings um, in the capital. Um, as working with the Green Party in Colombia, which is actually quite influential, unlike our Green Party in the US, um, because they're not completely a two party system. Um, so, trying to, his photos are going up in the halls of Congress to try to get people to realize, or lawmakers to realize what could be at stake um, if this port goes in. Um, this is a decently active group writing manifestos um, explaining eco you know, ecologically how much destruction this could create. I'm going to toss this up. Um, if you don't want to see a whale without a tail, you can turn away and I'll let you know when it's gone. Um, people are also, with you know, social media, people are also starting to realize um, the effects that humans can have on animals. Um, and so we had this juvenile whale last year um, that had a, we think, a net entanglement and it eventually just cauterized the wound and the tail fell off, you can see the vertebra um, showing straight through. So you think, you know, amputation from hips down. Um, I'm gonna take those off now so people who don't wanna see it, if you can open your eyes again and look back. Um, so people are starting to see negative effects, they're understanding that it's important um, and they're interested in the data that we're collecting to kind of show how pristine this area is at the moment and then use that to inform decisions um, about whether or not they want to keep it pristine or the economy is more important or any, you know, whatever argument that's being had. Um, we, so um, our goal for the project, which did not have all the po political and historical overtones at the beginning when I started doing it, I was purely interested in what's this environmental baseline for a breeding ground of stock G um, humpback whales in the southern hemisphere um, because it's very similar to stuff that I had done in grad school and in undergrad and I wanted to document this um, and it, you know it's turned political the way science does but we'll switch over to science now for real so we're gonna we're looking mainly at acoustic um, features so sound levels dial cycles repertoires of the species that are there 
Um, we also, though, have humpback whale ethogram and demographic studies going on along with photo ID. That's what Natalia started doing over 10 years ago. And so her data set for that is over a decade long. Um, adding in mercury toxicity studies with skin biopsies, which is what she learned in her postdoc. And then persistent organic pollutant studies with blubber biopsies, um, collaborating with a lab in Australia. And then stress hormone analysis is actually what Natalia is going to be doing for her Fulbright in Santa Cruz this fall. Um, and we're trying to expand. So now we're able to, we have a data set for stress hormones concurrent with when we're recording all these acoustic features. We can try to link those two between stress hormones and sound levels in the ecosystem. So we're going to focus on acoustic methods. So we had uh, Mark Lammer's ears on loan from us. We've put them in uh, Morumiko. So Morumiko is this top yellow star up on the map. It's the southern boundary for the um, Utria National Park, which whale watching does occur up there, but um, we're not allowed to go past it, trying to keep it more pristine so no boat engines. Boats don't um, always go up north of that spot. So we're on the southern end with an ear there in a place that we think is probably the quietest of the quiet if we had to pick a spot. Then our second one is the southern star at Nuki, which is where one of the airports is. And so the town's maybe two to 3,000 people. Um, and that's where everyone goes in. So that's where the medical clinic is. Um, the biggest grocery, uh, mar the markets are. Um, and so that's the most boat traffic going in and out. It's kind of the main town um, where all the boats will be going in and out of the river there. And so we would pick up probably the most disturbed area at that spot. Um, that year did not work in 2018, but we do have samples from um, both sites from last year. Um, so this is Moromiko up here, this little island, and we've got the ear is dropped just off the southwest corner of that island. So um, part of two students, Maria Paula and Valentina, have been going through and manually um, noting when each sound, when sound types are occurring. So we're looking in each 10 minute file um, and noting whether in each minute a sound source is present or not, and then making bar graphs from that. For now, the graphs look a little funky because started with every three hours we're filling, and then the first part was actually every single file, so every half hour. So that resolution's better as, you know, as more processing is done, the whole plot's gonna look more like the beginning of it. We'll have better resolution. Um, but we were looking at um, boats, fish, whales, snapping shrimp, and then wind, and looked for dolphins. Could not find dolphins so far in the bottom mounted recorders, but there's a student that is, um, let me go there, Daniel Noreña is looking at delphinid whistle repertoires in the bay for his undergrad thesis. And then Valentina is taking all of this information and simulating, um, making, prop making propagation model simulations of what she thinks based off of AIS data coming out of Buenaventura and the Panama Canal that um, configurations of shipping lanes could look like and what the noise could result um, coming out of there. On top of that, the master's student um, at the University of Bonn looking at humpback whale social sounds from a little bit farther north up the Gulf and a PhD student um, who's been there before I was there working on humpback whale song. Um, I'm gonna focus mainly on our dial cycling and soundscape stuff. Um, and the undergrad students uh, work for today. So if we're looking at power spectral densities, you're gonna see these plots the same way throughout where the cyan is 99th percentile, the median is green, and the first percentile is this mustardy color. Um, so we're looking full bandwidth on these before breaking it down into smaller bandwidths, which we'll be doing later, averaging every two seconds in a one hertz band resolution. And then these are the sound levels. Um, that are from those, um, the 10 minute files from the bottom mounted recorders that we can then compare to tidal and lunar cycles and the manual um, detection or the manual analysis of when boats and whales and fish um, were also vocalizing. 
So one thing that I thought was interesting, pointing out the lowest of the low here in the first percentile is down below 50 decibels. It was, I <laughs> think I went through and redid these calculations four times because I didn't think that was possible. I was surprised it didn't hit the noise floor of the instrument in all honesty. Um, but we are down here around 48 as our lowest peak level, averaging more around 50 um, decibels, which I, this is why I thought it was way too low and thought it was an error. Because if you look at the same bandwidths that I did back in other field sites using the exact same software, the same averaging per minute, uh, or averaging every two seconds, sorry, um, over the full bandwidth and plotting percentiles the same way um, with file sizes that were, so they were 20 minutes and not 10 minutes. The averaging would have um, gotten around that. In Glacier Bay, Alaska, this is only 74 dB. Laguna San Ignacio was 85. Cabo, near Cabo Pulmo, a little east of Cabo Pulmo, was 78. And so 50 seemed incredibly low. Um, there are physical reasons that this could happen. We're in 25 meters of water in Morumico, which is similar to where we were. Um, I had instruments deployed in two sites um, previously. The, the bottom is as mucky as mucky can get, which is much more absorptive of sound. But again, two sites um, that I had recorded previously were pretty similar to that. There's also this island shadow at Morumiko, which I think is the biggest problem. Um, it's similar-ish to the situation in Glacier Bay, but not quite. So I'd said before in the picture, we were southeast of this island. Um, because of safe scuba practices, we decided to put the ear next to a pinger system for sharks so that the scuba company could go back and check on our instruments from time to time when they were going down doing, um, checking on the shark pinger um, receiver also. Um, so, and if we fell off much farther, we would have gotten beyond the depth that the ear could handle. So um, we're in 25 meters of water, but it winds up taking out at least a quarter, if not a third of the degrees from which sound can travel to. So it's ba the ear is basically backed up against this island and there's this shadow from it where I don't, I think we're only receiving sound um, from about you know, maximum 270 degrees. So I think that's actually the biggest culprit of how our noise floor is so low. Um, once we run this for new key, then we'll get a better sense of what an open water site without this island shadow looks like with a little more boat traffic. But for now, the numbers are the lowest that I've sampled, which was the point of going <laughs> to this place to study baseline soundscapes in the first place. Um, so if we're looking at dial cycling, we're gonna switch gears a little bit now to um, the animals. Uh, the green line is the median, and I'm just putting the blue line here to show that in both the first percentile and the 50th percentile, you see these peaks. These are centered right around midnight every night, which is, the singing cycle for humpback whales that's been shown in Hawaii and Mexico. So the same thing, clear as day. There's a dial cycle with the humpback whale singing, peaking in the middle of the night. And then if we compare this, so the black lines are the illumination of the moon and the blue lines are the tide height. This is Spanish for those that know Spanish, please read your axes, otherwise I'll translate. Um, so the blue is our whales. So if you see this green arrow is pointing once we're at the new moon, there's also no whale singing for a good day. And then it slowly kind of ramps back up over the course of another couple of days as the moon illumination increases. This, however, uh, has a compounding variable, which over one month we're not going to be able to tease out, hence the reason that we're continuing the long-term time series. You compare the purple lines, which are boats, to the blue lines, which are whales. You can see spots where the whales are singing, that there are not any boat passes in those files or the files surrounding it. And then conversely, you can see where there's boat passes and no whales singing, a few whales singing in the files surrounding it. Um, and this middle one is also concurrent with when the new moon is. So this could be a byproduct of, it could be a combination of the new moon, and the boats are just the boats are just the effect of the moon. And that's not something that we know right now, but it will be interesting to keep capturing times of new and full moon in our data sets in subsequent years. 
So switching over to fish, our green lines are our fish. They're everywhere. <laughs> They're in all of the files all the time. There is a little bit of, you know, some recordings with fewer detections. There seems to be a little bit of a correlation between fewer fish detections during a waning moon cycle. Again, having one month of this is not um, conclusive. So we'll be look, kind of continuing to ask this question over the years as we collect more data. And then switching over to boats. Again, our purple lines are our boats. Um, the guys will drive in the middle of the night, new moon, full moon, no matter what. They can see the shadows of land and know where they're going. So it doesn't surprise me that there doesn't seem to be an effect on lower boat traffic when it's darker out in the middle of the night. Um, however, the thing to point out in this is that our 99th percentile or our cyan lines, um, those peaks line up very nicely as a boat detector um, for when boats are passing by Moromiko. So um, we can start looking into that as using it for a boat detector, you know, good student project later on. And then the peaks in those levels, we go from about 60 dB up to about 75 when those boats are passing, depending upon how close they are and how fast they're going, of course. Um, but a boat pass can increase the soundscape at Moromiko by 15 decibels. So we're gonna jump then into, so what I was just talking about is mainly Maria Paula's thesis, um, switching over to what Valentina is doing for hers as she's looking more at propagation modeling. The, um, <laughs> model that we're using is the one that my company uses, which is the parabolic equation um, in a very nice uh, C format, so bash scripting. Um, but we need starter fields and variables to inform um, those models. And so Valentina is going through and measuring features of different humpback whale song units, um, figuring out how to do that for snapping shrimp clicks, um, fish um, creeks and all of the sounds that they're making so that we can create starter fields for to represent these different animals to see how their communication strategy how their communication space varies with their different features um, we picked this unit called we've been calling it the te amo unit because when it's singing the te amo um, and it was a new according to christina it was a new song unit in 2018 it's easy to pick out decently easy to pick all of the frequency or all of the features out when you're, when you're learning how to do it in Raven. And so we averaged out 10 of these random, um, 10 of these Te Amo units from a single song. And then this media, the median, in bold down at the bottom is what we can plug into as the peak frequency we want to propagate into um, a model, the parabolic equation. For those who don't know what it is, I'm not going to put up an equation. It's crazy. Um, but it solves the wave equation using paraxial approximation for anyone who actually understands those words. That's great. Um, but so when you're looking at how to model sound in an environment, a parabolic equation is not the only one. There's also ray tracing. Um, you can use tools like Bellhop and Kraken um, to uh, propagate how the sound pressure travels or the sound rays travel through the water column itself as it interacts with the environment. Um, of that water column. The advantage for parabolic equation and why we use it largely is because this can address range dependent environments. So each range unit that the model steps out, it recalculates the sound pressure in 360 degrees, given things like the bathymetry, which we pull in using JEBCO um, data sets, or climatology using the World Ocean Atlas data sets. Um, and so that depth and bathymetry and sediment um, the parabolic equation can handle this range dependence. It's the industry standard for full wave propagation, specifically low frequency sound. It gets very costly as you go higher into the multiple kilohertz, um, but for humpback whale song and the recording rate, the sampling rates that we're using um, in Moromiko, this is the best model out there right now. Um, so what that looks like, if this movie plays, um, we took 10, Instead of just, so we can do an average, the median of those 10 Te Amo song units. Um, we also went through and did the peak frequency of those 10 and cycled them over each other because they are slightly different. The peak frequencies change. As they change, you know, a few tens of hertz um, around each other, you get a slight 
commun the communication space overall um, tends to stay the same, but they propagate slightly differently and it makes for a pretty movie. Um, the 11 kilometers, I should say, this bottom extreme of it is where Three Buga would be. And so we've put the whale at our Morumiko site um, just for this simulation to understand from Morumiko how far north into Utria National Park could that sound spread, which is, you know, 11 or more kilometers, how far down into the Gulf around Tribuga, Nuki and Choco, could it spread where if people are coming out of Nuki, um, could the boats in reverse affect a whale or could a whale hear a boat coming out of Nuki um, from while it's even in this, these protected areas of the national park um, and under certain conditions, possibly very faintly. Um, but we're repeating these over and over. So this is part of Valentina's project is to look at, now we have the communication space for a whale. How does it vary across these other parameters that she's manually pulling out of the song that we've been recording? Um, and then on top of that, what are the, um, if we do the same thing for modeling the boats in the area, like we have GPS tracks of the boats that we were on when we were working. Um, if we had GPS tracks of other people's boats and we, you know, know some common routes, just people traveling between the different towns, what communication space or what amount of the communication space would be overlapped um, with uh, noise from passing boats. So that's looking at impact volumes of right now with just small boats and then projecting into the future of what it could look like if there's a new port and shipping lanes coming in with large boats. So an impact volume for anyone who doesn't know is the amount of space from a sound source or sound levels are above a specified threshold. One of these thresholds, um, for example, is um, the behavioral threshold for baleen whales, which is RMS value, not peak pressure, not SEL. Um, however, peak pressure and SEL have their own thresholds also which you can use to calculate um, impact volumes from. Um, this leads to an understanding of how the communication space of a species can be reduced by a nearby noise source, which is our end goal to model now and in the future. So like I said, ongoing work. Some of the, the three simulations that Valentina has put together. So the, um, in all of these, the ships coming out, these little red and yellow dots coming out of the Panama Canal and coming out of Buenaventura are actual ships um, that are running AIS and those are their configurations. Based off of those, um, there's a shipping lane that's going, so assuming that there would be something similar with Tribuga in terms of the tonnage that that port is projected to be able to handle. Um, so the spacing of the ships is similar as that coming out of Buenaventura to simulate that. And then we have a shipping lane going straight up to the Panama Canal. One headed out to Long Beach, one headed out to Oceana, one headed down the west coast of South America, and one heading into Buenaventura. Um, so we can look at that. So this was the first one that Valentina made. And one of the things that we noticed a lot is up here on the shelf, um, if you look at the bathymetry, there's a lot more sound that's being, um, that's being maintained in that area than when we're along this trough here. So we moved this Oceana um, shipping lane along a, this deep water channel, which is the whole reason um, why, one of the reasons cited of why Tribuga would be such a great place for a port is this is that deep water channel. So if we put the shipping lane out to Oceana right over top of that channel, continue to have um, the coastal one down the west coast of South America staying there. Um, and then keep the kind of, uh, don't, don't have as many boats in the other shipping lanes. Um, we can still see how much the sound stays right up along the coast and then dissipates in deeper water. Um, I should make the clarification that this is all just one depth that we're looking at. This is not a conglomerate, this is not um, averaged over all depths. And then looking at a randomized model. So if there are no shipping lanes, <laughs> um, what could it look like? So going through a set of these models and then figuring out how to quantify what, um, what communication space reduction 
could come from these or what the impact volumes are and how to compare those from these configurations of ships, which each one of these had 47 ships in them. That is what Valentina is figuring out right now. So we do notice that the sound levels are highest along this, these narrow shallow shelves. And because of the shelf further north, sound levels seem to be contained a bit more. Um, then we're gonna switch over to Danielle's thesis, um, which is the whistle repertoire of several delphinid species that are in the area. Um, and so he has seven different whistle types that he's been classifying the whistles into. Um, a couple of the common ones are in the spectrograms down below. Um, and then when we have, so these are separated out by the five species that he was able to record over the side um, with a hydrophone while getting uh, concurrent ethograms with these groups. Um, so species could be validated. Uh, rise is the most common whistle type. For these guys, rise in U-shape. Um, so if we look through, there's several whistle types that are used very commonly and like flat and wave are used very rarely, but they do exist. And then if we, we're gonna combine all of these at the all of the the most common type for each species combined together um, our statistics that Daniel has started to collate um, and so we start getting distributions of different acoustic features of these whistles these are going to get pulled out into each whistle type for each species as well um, to look at how they contribute to the overall distributions and then it, it get put into a whole catalog of what the whistle repertoire was for these groups, assuming they're representative of the species in the area before the port. So, assumably, if the port is built, then um, you know down the road another student can repeat the study and look how much it's changed, and track. We can track that over time if there's changes or not in the whistles themselves. So, I think we're at conclusions. We should hopefully give plenty of time for questions. Um, so right now we have more sound sources than we can currently identify. Most of these are fish species. Um, we think the most common one is a damsel fish from talking to scuba divers in Hawaii and the scuba divers that are there with us. So it's fun to go tell the students to go on a wild goose chase and figure it out because if they find something, they're able to make significant contributions. Um, all of these species, I should say, so when I showed up in Colombia, I could not find an acoustician to be my sponsor for the Fulbright. Um, so, you know, thankfully, Photo ID Natalia decided to take, you know, host me um, and rely on, oh, I knew something about acoustics. Um, but we're growing. If I count, I can count nine of us, but that includes two Americans, which I'm not sure we count. Um, humpback whale dial cycle exists. Is it because of a new moon or boats? We don't know yet. The fish may have a lunar cycle. Again, we need more data. Um, we knew that this was a remote, relatively pristine location because of the few numbers of people that lived there and the low infrastructure, but we didn't realize just how low the ambient sound levels were, and I should have an asterisk there of at Motormiko in an area with the shadow, and we will figure out how true that is once the new key data are processed. Um, and then, so this does actually make the Ruga a key place for comparing disturbed soundscapes to the few remaining pristine ones left. So if we compare this, we're talking of comparing this to Buenaventura, it would be really cool to compare this to Long Beach or New York or um, Mumbai or Chen, you know, other um, major ports in large countries. Um, conservation efforts publicly are a big thing inside of Colombia right now. Uh, we've had, I know that my contact information has been asked for by a senator. A woman in the House of Representatives has tweeted out one of these maps of Valentina's, um, which got you know some shares. So with Felipe Mesa and a lot of the projects that are going on internally, um, there's a lot of awareness being raised about how destructive a port could be. Um, and so watching that unfold and trying to be able to inform that or at least give people data from their own backyard so that they can inform their own decisions is uh, it's interesting. It's a little unnerving personally, um, but very interesting. So I'm just gonna say thank you.
to everyone who's helped us and we can open it up for questions, which I'll leave you with a pretty Felipe photo. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate uh, the talk. Um, we do have a few minutes for those of you that are online and you'd like to, uh, uh, you can either send a question through chat or you could, um, you can unmute your mic and, and ask Carrie directly, whichever you prefer. I, I had a question. Yeah. This is Jen from UNH. I see um, you. Yeah. Uh, my, do you know, like you've done some, you're, you and your, your colleagues have done some cool modeling of, of projecting sound based on um, shipping lane placement. Has there been any decision on those shipping lane placements and will they take any of your work and modeling into consideration as they determine that? Yeah, so that winds us down a slippery slope. So there's been, there are a few documents out, which is what Valentina is working from is kind of verbiage of how many tons will be coming in and out of port and the ports they would be transiting to. Um, we're not quite sure how to send this information out. Like there is the fear of if we show that there's a best case scenario, technically any noise is the bad case. Any set of shipping lanes is worse than no shipping lanes. But I don't think we want to, we don't want to give this false hope of, oh, there's a, there's a way to do it that's conservation oriented. Which I mean, if you're looking at just shipping lanes, sure, there could be a variation of least impactful to more impactful, but any of those are more impactful than nothing. So I think we're trying more to figure out how to package that right now. Um, there might be access to people using it to inform models. Um, there are people that are aware are in the government, obviously, that are aware that this is going on. Um, and contact information has been sought out. I haven't heard from that senator. Um, but we will see. I think that's, you know, if we can package it ethically, that's the goal. Hey, Carrie, I have a question. Hey, hey so Liz from uh, UNH. Nice you. Yes, uh, I was just wondering, um, some of your, your modeling, um, you said it was based on the JEBCO grid, and I was just wondering, mm -hmm. uh, I know that a lot of that data hasn't been updated in, you know, 20 plus some places, a hundred years. Uh, mm -hmm. Is is there data there that's recent for the bathymetry or is that something that you would hope to improve upon in the future? That or are you not concerned at all? I don't know. <laughs> no, that's a huge thing for this area. So you go searching for data sets from the Colombian government and the Colombian Navy and they're not there. Um, and so, I don't know in this area what the JEBCO 2019 uh, data set has. It very well could be stuff from 20 years ago. I'm not sure. Um, it's better than nothing, but it is one of those sort of hand wavy parts of the model where you're like, well, we sort of know it's sandy underneath us. <laughs> right, you were just had mentioned um, yeah. potentially like canyon features or something like that. It just seems like potentially those could be uh, those could change pretty dramatically in terms of um, yes. if there's currents or mm -hmm. depending on how much time has passed, there might be something to consider. Yeah, so when you like the bathymetry itself, you can see it just kind of, it goes to fuzziness. It does, yeah. I mean, but close. it's very it close really to does. the shore, <laughs> so I'm not surprised. I was just wondering, but you, you do project pretty far out offshore and I just it, it does look like there is some information there but I wonder how much of it is like Smith and Sandwell you know from satellites which doesn't give you a lot of resolution um, right. in terms of the you know the spatial resolution everything mm -hmm. kind of gets squished out so. yeah no that's exactly a concern that we have yeah. and we would love to find better bathymetrical data but we haven't been able to fair enough cool thank you that was great by the way great presentation cool. thanks Carrie, you have a few questions in chat as well, and I'll, yeah. I'll read off the first one. I don't know if you want to look at them, but one of them was about, are there any efforts underway by the port to incentivize quieter ships, sort of like what's been happening in the port of Vancouver? Mm. How do I say that without a biased tone? <laughs> I'm going to guess no. Um, I, I, I don't want to be a jerk about it. They might be. Um, my guess is no. My guess is also that conversation, it's too soon for that mm -hmm. conversation in the halls of Congress. 
Um, probably something that would be interesting to talk about when we're there in person with the council and be like, hey, these technologies exist. Like there is a, not a the high speed ferry up here in Seattle doesn't use a propeller. It's all air propulsion. And so it's uh, a friend, actually Richard Campbell, the guy who um, does, has done the parabolic equation and has made it into the C code that we use. He's like, oh yeah, if I have a hydrophone over my ship, he's like, I can't hear the high speed ferry coming. So when I'm out paddling, that's the thing that I need to be careful of because I'm not going to hear it. So tell, yeah, getting people to know that those technologies exist and then talking about incentivizing them, I think is down the road. Um, I haven't heard of that conversation happening. I'm also not in the know in the halls of Congress. Um, and I'm on a WhatsApp group of people talking about this, but again, all in Spanish, and I'm sure there's things that are lost in translation for me still. So, let's see. It looks like, it looks like Natalia has made some comments along those lines as well. Yes, she's the person that should be answering these. <laughs> yeah. cool. Hi, Carrie, this is Joe Warren from Stony Brook. Um, hey, I had a question for you. What, what did you find was the biggest slash road roadblock or surprise with working in a, a remote area? Um, I've had issues with like getting gear through the airport customs. Mm -hmm. uh, were you missing, you know, widgets that you needed to secure things? Um, or, or was it just, um, you know, the, the typical chaos of field work? Yeah, it was pretty typical. So far it was fine. Um, in terms of getting everything through customs. This last year was a little skeptical when I came in with, I mean, I always have two bags and one's full of gear, but I had extra gear this year because I was using, I had acoustic releases because mm -hmm. um, we can't scuba at New Key. We learned the hard way that that is not a wise thing to do and that much Merc. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were using an acoustic release on that. And I definitely got stopped that year by customs saying, what is this? And I had to pull the like, well, I have students, I have an IANA university for their theses, I'm bringing the stuff for them to youth, I'm not selling it. Um, I had more of a struggle so far in Mexico, the year that we like actually uh, paid to get a carnet and then lost an instrument down a finger canyon and they thought we'd sold it on the black market. So right. Mexico was harder than Colombia so far. Um, well, what about permits or did the local collaborators handle that? Yeah, so that's another thing that Natalia can explain because she set this all up like 10 years ago. When we go in, we have a meeting. Before we do anything, um, we have a meeting with the local council that, you know, we explain what we're doing, give them information from what we had done the previous year and ask for permission. And then they decide whether or not we can do that. Um, as far as I know, there is n the group that I'm working with has never been told no. Um, because like Natalia has asked for biopsies, that's been fine. Um, she does all the photo ID over the side hydrophones. So, so far, um, we try to keep transparency. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of these results, they, we not always great at it because of how conferences line up and posters, but try to give them results um, before it goes into like a publication or something because it's, you know, their backyard, they're entitled to it. So we try to keep those lines of communication open um, and so far so good. Um, and then like the ingenuity of the people around there, there's enough stores and enough things you can order from a boat. There is a boat that comes in with things you order in a magazine every week or two. And so if we really had to get something, we could have that shipped in or we have friends in the cities that can buy us something and like stick a package on one of the planes coming in and we would pick that up. Um, it's not going down to a Home Depot, but it's accessible if we needed a piece or a part somewhere. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have other questions from for for Carrie? I wish I could see the chats. I still haven't figured out how to do that. <laughs> well, um, well uh, Natalia is making some really nice comments about the uh, uh, importance of consulting with the general community council and the Koki council and. Uh, yeah, she's the authority on all of that with all of the experience. So definitely read her comments. Mm -hmm. Is there a sense, Carrie, that um, you, know, you mentioned the Green Party and, and an entity in Colombia that's focused on um, natural resource conservation? Is there a sense that they understand the utility of soundscape 
analysis in, in a marine or even a terrestrial setting is, is, is a tool that can be used to kind of gauge or monitor the health of, of the ecosystem? Um, yeah, in conversations with people, it seems like once you tell them, oh, this is a thing and mm -hmm. this is how it works, that it's pretty intuitive of, oh, that's important. I definitely get that feeling. Um, when we show maps like this to the boat drivers or like, you know, people in town near where we stay, it's like, oh, this is, you know, how far you can hear a humpback whale. Um, there's, you see like these aha moments of like, oh yeah, this makes sense. It's cool to see it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, there's definitely people who seem, definitely seem to get it and think it's important. Um, I get the sense that there are groups that are looking for any set of, any sort of tool to talk about like ecosystem health um, of an area terrestrial or marine. Nice. Well, it sounds like a, a great project. And, and I know I had talked to you a little bit about this in the past and uh, the, the results are really exciting. I have, I have one question about the kind of the biological diversity of the, of the site. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard you mention a few species, both mammalian and fish. Um, are, are there any, Bio, have there been any biological assays done of the site um, that you can kind of use your soundscape recordings to try to understand, you know, what species outside of the ones that you mentioned specifically, mm -hmm. what other species might be there that, you know, if you go back another 10 years from now and if the port is finished, that you'd be able to monitor explicitly for maybe as like sentinel species in the area. Yeah, so there's a project um, that, it's hopefully happening in the Caribbean to do that. And I think the student who might work on that, I saw her name on here. Um, the Pacific Coast here, the closest thing that I found to that is, I don't remember if it's called a Choco or Maraviva. There are posters around the towns that are like, these are the fish mm -hmm. that people are fishing for. And so right. it's like the catch mm -hmm. rates um, on average, like what are, if you pull in a, a hand net, um, what's well, usually the distribution of the fish species you see. Um, so there's that. It's more like the fishing records mm -hmm. um, that people have put together essays from. There's now three scuba diving companies or outfits, three, three places capable of doing scuba diving in that area. And they've talked about it. Obviously, like, usually if I'm like, oh, are there damsel fish around? I call Lily, <laughs> mm -hmm. who's you know, the, the scuba diver that we hire. And she's like, oh, yeah, there's damselfish everywhere. So there's knowledge that people have. That some of it's in poster form. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it I don't think is written down that I think would be a very valuable project um, for someone to go and just do all those interviews to figure out what people have seen and try to put that together. Um, so it's partially there, but not mm -hmm. completely. Yeah. I, I know that um, oftentimes in, in these ventures, um, tapping into the local uh, traditional knowledge sometimes can can definitely be useful and, and you know <laughs> this is a place where that's relied on for mm -hmm. sure <laughs> yeah very cool um, well there's some good conversation in chat uh, Natalia and, and Dale uh, both made some nice comments about uh, diversity and work being done there so um, I think we're we're just about out of time for the hour um, Kira I really appreciate the talk this has been really interesting um uh we'll definitely have to recoup again in the future and yeah. and follow this story this is our last um presentation for the care series uh, for the year and, and maybe i'll let jen uh kind of wrap things up in that respect but we're excited uh going into next fall for another series of of uh, presentations and hope looks like we had really good turnout i think at one point i saw 72 people logged on and listening to your talk, Carrie. So um, wow, can you say a word or two? I saw seventy six. <laughs> seventy six. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, everybody. Um, unfortunately, our regional in person got canceled due to the COVID conditions, and there was, I didn't think there was any reason to do it virtually since we do these virtually um, once a month. And really, the the focus of the symposiums was really to be in person and make those connections in person. So we will pick that up again next year. Um, we might even be able to think about doing it in January or earlier in the year so we don't go a full two years without the symposium. We have the money to do it. It's just finding a good time that works for people. So just keep your eye on the website and um, I hope everybody stays safe and safe and healthy.
so the, <clears throat> the short answer on on uh, bathymetry is that there's nothing new there. Okay. Very, the the chat has some clues about how to find the files. Great. I appreciate that. Yeah, filling in any little holes is it's great. Not that bathymetry is a little hole in modeling. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> it's a big deal. <laughs> That's a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. So I guess then we will uh, we'll, uh, meet again in the fall and we'll have a, a, a new suite of, of uh, seminar speakers. But I definitely want to hear back, Carrie, on, on your work moving forward and, and how this uh, project uh, kind of continues to develop over time. Yeah. Fingers crossed, this is, turns into a long-term thing for decades. So, you know, the interest level of students is really high. So, you know, all the projects are there for them and that's been a blast. Let me, let me just say too, for people who are still online, if you would like to give a seminar to this group, please email Dan or I so we know, because we're always looking for seminar speakers. If there's someone that you would really like to see give a seminar, also, send us an email and let us know if there's a topic that you'd like to see a seminar on because your thesis focused on it and there's no one at your university that has that expertise, let us know. We can try and, and really make these seminars useful to the most people um, by taking your feedback. All right. Thank you, Carrie. I'm going to stop recording now and get this posted uh, very soon.